one, two. So if we're taking a look at lesson one, two, let me show you how you would get into everything from PowerSchool Learning. So I'm in on Clever. If you go through Clever, you can just click the PowerSchool Learning. There's your icon. Uh-oh. Uh Let's try this again. There you go. Click on it. And make sure you sign in with Google. You'll need to sign in with Google. And so once you're here, click on Pre-Calculus out of your list of classes. And I want to draw your attention to the front page. If you want to have the zoom up on your, on your own desk so you can see everything larger, just scroll down and choose your appropriate period, which for us right now, you're live, it's fifth period. So you just click whichever link you want right from the front page. Now I mentioned this is lesson one, two. So what does that mean? You go to chapter one, chapter one, and this will be what normally would be the second lesson. It's just for chapter one, we have a review lesson uh, that starts at the top. And well, and SLO, so I'll walk you through those in a second, but I just want to scroll down to lesson one, two, and draw, draw your attention to everything you need here. Again, um, if you're here in person, like which I hope you are, Again, I'm recording this, so uh, thank you for being here. That is what I recommend. But if you can't be here for any reason, obviously join the Zoom. Again, there's a links as well for one, two. On number two, you have uh, your attendance. Oh, I skipped one thing. There are digital resources. This is especially important if you're not in the room. You're not able to get these. Those are all right there as well. Uh, so if you're at, gone for athletics or sick or just going to visit family or something like that, that's all right there for you. That number two, you can click that for your attendance link as well as scan the QR code. Both of those work. Finally, what we're going to do in class is go through the lesson one, two. Now, this says here, click the exam one, two. I would recommend just opening that up right now. So when you click this exam button, it says click that button at the bottom. So that's right. I'm talking about this link right there near the very bottom of this box for one dash two. If you open that up and then slide to the bottom, it says start this exam. And it'll open up exactly what we see on our problem. Now, uh, notice I don't have number one in here, but I do start with number two uh, and going on through there. So I'm going to slide this over because we'll use this today. Now, with that aside, that's what you would do normally for every lesson. I'm going to draw your attention now since it's the start of the second week of school. Just some things you could do to get a free hundred and just make sure you know where everything is. Up at the top, we have a uh, of chapter one, top of chapter one, full, you have a SLO pre-assessment. This is math that unless you failed pre-calculus, you most likely have never seen. Just take it. If you don't know at all what it is, don't cheat. Just multiple choice, yes to it. You get a completion grade. So it doesn't matter if you get a zero or a 100. Your grade, if you take it, it's going to be a 100. Okay, so don't cheat on that. That's an SLO pre-assessment. That's one of the three free hundreds you can get. There's one. On the main page, you could turn into your syllabus. The main page, you can turn in your syllabus. But right now, we have about half the students have done so. But yours will say turn in, I believe, right there. If you click that, you can either take a picture of that paper form, or if you want to open up a digital copy, save it to your computer, save it to your own Google Drive, and then type your name in up and have your parents do the same, or a guardian, and then upload it. That can get you a, a, a free hundred. So that's two of them. The third was doing the Alex knowledge check, the initial knowledge check. Has everybody in here done that? And if you didn't get my remind message, the class, uh, the district finally made your classes. So before I did it, but that's why we we're having to type in so many codes. The district finally did it and it reset everything. So you probably will have to take the initial knowledge check again. Is that the case? Has anybody opened it up to see? Did you have to take the knowledge check again? Or did anybody open it up yesterday after fourth period? Did it make you take the knowledge check? or just, Oh, great. So you don't have to do that again? Perfect. So if you done it once, you should uh, have a free hundred for that. All right, with that, any questions? Let's get started on lesson one, two. Okay, the first question, it says, what is the domain and range of this graph? And so we went over some algebra portion last class. Now let's go over how we would find domain and range looking visually. Domain and range. Domain deals with the x values. So if you're thinking about domain, it's basically you're looking at what x values is used. If you were going to map out every single point, which x values would be used that would, to graph this relation here? Uh, and so one technique I use to explain this to students is if you've ever seen a trash compactor, what do I mean by trash compactor? One of those things you throw your trash in 
and someone presses a button, it smashes it. Like my uh, every Friday at my house, I pull out my trash to the street. A garbage uh, truck comes by, they pick it up, they dump it in, and then it closes the walls and smash it to create more space. That's what I'm about to do here. Okay, so here, here's how I express the trash compactor. I want you to look at my screen. And again, if, you're, if you have the Zoom open, you can be looking at your own computer. But I have these two lines. If you're searching for the domain off a graph, I want you to imagine that these two dotted lines I have are smashing the graph towards the x-axis. And again, they're, they're smashing towards the x-axis because I'm looking for the domain, and domain deals with x. So if you smash the graph in this direction, what would happen? Well, this blue piece of graph that's going upward, let me get a blue piece here. This blue piece of graph that's going upward, if it were smashed down by that green dotted line, would go down like this. Do you follow what just happened? What I just did with this piece? So I made this piece right here get smashed down to become that piece. So this is no longer there. I want you to visualize it that way. And the same would be true for the the blue piece of the graph going down and to the right, it would be smashed up towards the x-axis. So all the graph gets smashed to the x-axis. That's what I want you to envision. And now the domain would be any x value used in this graph. So how far left does this graph get used? Nope, it doesn't go on forever to the left. Till zero. zero, it begins at zero. Now, if you don't see a dot open or closed, if you don't see a dot at all, you assume it to be like a closed dot, which would mean a bracket or an equal to sign. So here in inequalities, I would say zero is less than or equal to X. And if I was using uh, interval notation, I would do bracket zero comma. Okay, now we ask the question, how far to the right does this graph travel? Now, when I smash this down, it was still an arrow. So what does that mean if it's an arrow? It's going to continue on to the right. And what number represents going right forever? Infinity. infinity. And so on interval notation, you need to include the infinity. Does infinity get a bracket or parenthesis? Parenthesis, perfect. And on inequalities, you do not have to include a infinity. You can just leave it like that. So you could write your answer if either of the two. That's inequalities. That's intervals. Good to have you. I'm just walking in. Good to have you. So this is in inequalities. Mm -hmm. And this is an interval notation. That's the difference. Oh, this is domain here. Okay, that's the domain. So why do I need to label that? Because we also need to find the range. So at this stage, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to restart my graph. But this time for the range, I'm going to smash everything to the y-axis. I want you to envision everything being pushed to the y-axis. So here we go. Let me clear this. I'll give you a moment. So now, here are my two pieces of graph, and I want you to envision the walls being smashed in for the range, which means you smash everything to the y-axis. Now, when I do so, this piece of graph gets smashed like this towards the y-axis, and this piece of graph down here gets smashed towards the negative y-axis, that direction. And so this piece of graph going up to the right is now been moved over here. And this piece has now been smashed over there. What I've done is ultimately I've stripped out the domain. And all that's left is range. Range is y. All that's left are the y values. So I'm going to ask you now the question. With range, you always go lowest to highest. How low does this graph travel? Negative, Negative infinity. So if I were using... Uh, intervals, I would need to include that, negative infinity. For inequalities, you don't. Okay, how high does this graph travel? Positive infinity. And so I would have, that would be an interval notation. Now, if it's both infinities with inequalities, the symbol you do, it would be, in this case, Y, E, R. That means the range is all reals. Y, E, R. And then R is technically a double R. Any questions over this? So again, this is inequalities. This would be interval notation.
I call that technique trash compactor, just a way of visualizing what's happening with domain and range. All right, now uh, problem number two asked, is this problem a function? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about it. Is this graph a function? Five, four, three, two, one. No. Oh, I hear both. Yeah and no. Okay, so I think I'm hearing more no's. Can someone give me a reason why it's not? Yeah. Uh, the vertical thing. Can someone be more specific? He's close. Vertical line test. It says a vertical line test says if you pass a vertical line through the graph and it hits the graph at more than one location at any time, then it is not a function since this can hit there and there. I, again, I could have used this green line anywhere in the graph, but I just put it through right here. Since it hits twice, this fails the vertical line test. And if it fails the vertical line test, it is not a function. It is not a, fun, uh, not a function because it failed the vertical line test. What do we call something that's not a function? A relation. A relation. You call it a relation because it is relating the x's and y's together, but it's not a function. All right. And finally, number three, a little review of domain and range from an algebra viewpoint. Uh, so here's our rules, and here's the number three. I know it's really small right there, but here's the rules that I gave you last time for domain. You assume that it's going to be all re reals. I didn't write that in here, but we start with the assumption that the graph's going to be all reals. And then the only thing that's going to change that are, right up this, this time, these two rules, that you cannot divide by zero, and you cannot take a negative square root. So symbolically, I wrote them like this last class. I said that... Um, x cannot equal zero in the denominator. And again, I just put one in the numerator, no matter what's up in the numerator. That'll only affect the range, not the domain. And then for a square root, that rule, number two, I did a square root greater than or equal to zero. So, excuse me, x is greater than or is equal to zero within the square root. So as we look at this problem, you need to ask yourself, do you see any division? Yes, if you're dividing by an x, this says we cannot equal zero. So what I'm going to do is here is draw an open circle. I'm using a number line here. I'm going to draw an open circle. That means I cannot equal zero. And next, do you see a square root with an x inside of it? Yeah. What does that eliminate? Mm -hmm. What are you not allowed to have with square roots? Mm -hmm. A negative. So I can't have negatives. What does that mean? That means my number line will extend from zero to the right. That's ugly. Let me try this again. Let me make it a solid line. This will make it like this. Let's make it look superb. My number line, I cannot equal zero, but I can be any positive number. That means the negatives were eliminated as well as zero is out. Okay, so what does that mean for solving this? I take the inside portion, x minus three, and I say that it's got to be greater than zero. It cannot be equal to zero because I would be dividing by zero. And it cannot be negative because you cannot take this negative square root. Does that make sense how I've gotten that symbol from these two rules? The cannot equal eliminated the zero. That's why I did an open circle. That's like a parenthesis. And it's got to be positive. This rule says positive or uh, non-negative. So positive or zero. But we've already eliminated zero. So that eliminated the negatives. So those, since those are both eliminated, it had to be the positive numbers. So now it's just one step to solve this. What's my domain going to be? X is greater than 3. When you add the 3 over, that's right. X is greater than 3. That's the domain as, uh, we call that an interval or an inequality. That's an inequality. As an interval, we're saying X is going to be larger than 3, which means 3 needs to go on the smaller side of the comma. There's only one number, so what do I put on the other side? Infinity. Infinity always takes a parentheses or bracket. Parentheses. What about three? What does it take? Parentheses. Parentheses as well because it does not have the line underneath. So for that reason, it would be a parenthesis there. There it is as an interval. Now, I'm going to show you the graph real quick. So from the lesson one, two, I'm just going to hit the Desmos button. So in lesson one, two, and digital res or the resources, I'm just going to hit the Desmos button. 
And when this opens up, I just want a blank graph. So I'll just grab this. So the top link, the very top one you click is a blank graph. I'm gonna click that. And we'll enter in this equation, f of x equals one divided by the square root of x minus three. And I want you to notice that this graph does go to the right forever. Does this graph go left forever? No. 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 You'd ask yourself, where does that graph start? Well, if I did a table, you'd see really quickly that the table seems to start at four, but that's not true. It starts at immediately after three. So if I did like 3.0001, we would have a value. Notice it starts exact, uh, immediately after three. So though three does not exist, that's why it's not an equal to sign. It does start immediately after three. And you could add in a bunch of ones and you're still going to get a value or a bunch of zeros, I'm sorry. Okay, I want you to make sure you know how to submit these in before we get started. So again, open up your Power School Learning, go to lesson one, two, exam one, two, that's when you're gonna click and then hit start this exam. You should see something similar to what I have in the bottom corner of my screen. And you can fill in your answers for the bell ringer. Okay, and I'm gonna pause here. So one more time before we start this new lesson, let's review uh, how we would find the domain of any type of equation. What should you assume without even looking at the, uh, the equation? What do you assume the domain will be uh, at the start? Okay, y'all are looking at the problem. Without looking at the problem, just any, if I have, if I told you I'm about to give you a function, what would you assume the domain is going to be before you ever see it? The answer is all reals. Let me just show you visually why. Uh, if you start going through all the graphs you know of, y equals x, y equals x squared, y equals x cubed. Uh, sorry, y equals 2 to the power of x, exponential. Any of these graphs, what do you notice about all of them? They're all reals. So graphs start all reals unless something limits that graph, okay? So you should assume that the domain's going to be all reals until you look at it. Now you look at it and you ask yourself, does it break one of the two rules potentially? Does this have a rule attached to this problem? Yeah. Yes. What can you tell me is true about a square root? It can't be negative. So using the number line, if I use the number line like the last problem, as far as the number line is concerned, a square root cannot be negative values. Can a square root be zero? Yes. And can it be positive? Yes. So it can be any of these values. A square root can be any of these values, but it cannot be negative. That's out. So what does that mean? I would say that the inside portion, x minus 7, has to be what symbol compared to zero? Okay, and why is this one equal to? Because it can be zero. Because you can take the square root of zero, and it's a closed dot. So the rule for a square root, the way I showed it before, it was rule two. I said that x has to be greater than or equal to zero, and that's why I'm taking that symbol. And so for this domain, how would you solve this problem? You would add seven. And so if I showed you this graph, you would see that it would begin at the value of seven and continue on to the right forever. So I'm going to clear this off again because you're assuming it's all reals unless something limits it. This problem is limited to beginning at seven and then it's all reals to the right. So square root x minus seven. Notice that this spot, the graph is beginning at seven on the x-axis. It's beginning at seven and then it's continuing forever to the right. That's how that domain rules work. So the more you see this, the more it'll start to hit your head. Up. Oh, I got it. You assume it's all reals. Unless you see a square root or a division, that's what will limit the domain. This one, will it be all reals? Will this graph be all reals? Yeah. And will not be all reals. Why not? When you divide, what are you not allowed to divide by? Zero. So it's showing you by number line. What this means is the domain, if you start with saying, hey, it can be all reals. I'm assuming it can be all reals. It can be negatives. It could be zero. It could be positive. You start there, and then you look at it and say, oh, wait, there's division. What's the one thing I cannot divide by? Zero. zero. That means it's like an open circle there. But I can divide by positives. 
I can divide by negatives. So this domain will extend both ways, to the left and the right forever. There's just going to be one value in the middle. It cannot equal. So how would you determine what that value is? Oh, here was the rule. In rule form, I wrote it out this way. X cannot equal, excuse me, 1 divided by X cannot equal 0. That's how I wrote it by rule. So what you would do is you just take the denominator. The numerator deals with the range. The numerator deals with the range, not the domain. The domain is going to be set from the denominator. So I would just say 2X minus 5 cannot equal 0, and I would solve this. How do I solve this equation right here? For X, how do I isolate the X? Oh, you already got the answer. Jay's a little fast. Someone else, let's go step by step. What would you do first to isolate this X? Oh, add add five. five. That's the opposite operation of a subtraction. So we would add five. Wait. Why? Why? Just checking to make sure y'all are paying attention. <laughs> okay, let's fix this. 2x plus five. Thank you. So what's the opposite operation of a positive five? Subtract. subtract. So we should be subtracting five. And so when I subtract five, I have 2x does not equal Negative 5. Good. Now what? Okay, and we're saying dividing because whenever a 2 is next to an x, does that mean multiply, subtract, add? Multiply. means multiply. And so the opposite operation of multiplication is division. So we divide there. And now we have that x cannot equal negative 5 over 2, which is negative 2.5. So what we're going to see when I graph this is this graph going to extend forever to the left, forever to the right, except there's going to be one break in the middle. And that break is going to be a negative 2.5, negative 5 halves. So I'll show you this equation now. B of x is going to equal 3x minus 1 over 2x plus 5. You'll notice it does extend forever to the left. It extends forever to the right. There's just one break. Where do we think that break is going to be located at? What did I say that is as a decimal? Negative 2.5 is where this is going to break. You see how that's a negative 4 there? It's not broken there. It's a negative 2. It's not broken there. It's somewhere in the middle. I'll help us out by typing in a vertical line, x equals 2.5. Negative 2.5, sorry. And you'll see that's right in the middle of the 2. You see how that breaks it apart? And you might think, well, it's touching it. No, it's not. But I zoom in. It never touches it. That 2.5 fills in where the broken spot is. The purple graph breaks at negative 2.5. The black graph is just representing, is just helping you see that, yep, that is right where it's broken. It is broken at negative 2.5. Isn't that amazing how algebra works? Here's the beautiful thing about algebra. It works every single time. Every single time. It always works. It's crazy. All right, one more just for good measure. I want to draw a number line that might be helpful for us. So here's a number line. There's zero. Here are the negatives. Here are the positives. Will this problem be all reals? Uh, no, no, no. no, why not? Because, it's a it's like it doesn't want to because we're dividing with an x, and we have a square root with an x side. So it's not going to be all reals. With division, what does that eliminate for the domain? Zero. zero. We cannot equal zero. So how do I represent that? You draw an open circle. Open circle. Great. I also have this square root. Which means, can't be negative. means no negatives. Which so I don't solve. I don't draw that part of the line in. I would just draw this part of the line in. Oops. And so the domain is going to go to the right, but not the negatives and not zero. Those are out. I don't have to put an X through there, by the way. I just did just to show you. So this is going to be my domain going this way. So by symbols, what does that mean about X squared minus 25? Again, the, the numerator just deals with the range, not the domain. We're talking about this portion and the denominator and the square root. What does that mean by symbols if it's going to be positives but not zero? You got it. Great. Starting to click. So let's do a little algebra. What's our first step here? Add 25 to both sides. So again, opposite operations when you isolate a variable. So what's the opposite of a square? 
Screw it. I gave you a rule that many students have never been taught last class. It had to do with when you add a square root. Why is it zero, Andrew? Oh, it's not a zero. Yeah, it's a 25. Can't you tell it's a 25? No. What is that, 25? It looks similar. <laughs> there you go. Okay, sorry. Got it. We're correct this time. Uh, let me ask that question again. Whenever you add a square root that's not originally there, what needs to come with that square root? Plus or minus, you'll have two separate answers. So we'll have the answer that x is greater than the positive square root of 25. What is square root of 25? Five. Five. X is greater than 5. But what's weird with inequalities is for the portion with the negative, whenever you add a negative on an inequality that's not there, if you ever have to multiply by negative 1, divide by negative 1, anyways, anytime you add a negative that's not originally there, the inequality switches direction. And so we'd have x is less than negative 5. Now, question is with inequalities, could I put this together as one inequality or do I need the word or in between? Or. So, oh, well, y'all are quick. Let's determine if we need an or or not. So how you know is you pick a number that's true for one and see if it's also true for the other. What's a number greater than five? Six. six. Is six also less than negative five? No. no. If it doesn't work for both, you need the word or. And this would be the answer. If it did work for both. If it did work for both, if six was true on both, you'd put it together as one inequality. All right, but that would be the answer this time. I'm not going to graph it. We're just going to move on. So last problem, and you're about to see how they get put together. Last review, and we're going. Here's my number line. Would you like me to give you three minutes to try this on your own first? All right, three minutes, you try it on your own first. So let's do this together. I now have, come on, number line, zero negatives, positives. When you look at this problem, will it be all reals? No. No. Why not all reals? Negative. So and negatives are, I hear you say negatives are eliminated because of the square root. Negatives are out. Okay. And what does the division eliminate? The zero. So it cannot equal zero. How do I represent that on the number line? Open circle, and it cannot be negatives. So I shade towards it or away from it? Away from it. So I'd be going this way, which means my symbol is going to be greater than zero. So I take that inside square root in the division portion, 16 minus x squared, and say that has to be greater than zero. Not equal to because of the division, not less than because of the square root. We go to solve. I like working with positives, so I'm going to move the x squared. You might not have done this, but I'm just showing you. I don't like negatives, so what's the opposite of subtracting an x squared? Let's add an x squared. So now I have that 16 is less than x squared. Mathematically, what's the opposite operation of a square? Square root. Square root. And now. When you add a square root that's not originally there, what comes with it? Uh, we need a positive and a negative here. So I will have uh, the positive square root of 16 is 4, this foot direction. But when I take the negative 4, the inequality by rule must change direction. So now we need to determine, can I put this together as one inequality, or does it need the word or, so here's how we figure this out. Someone pick a number that's less, that says four is greater than X. So someone pick a number that's less than four. Three. three. So four is greater than three. Would we agree with that? Three. Question, is three greater than negative four? Or is negative four less than three? Yes. yes, okay. So if it's true in both cases, you don't need the word or. What you do is you put them together. Write the smallest one first. So negative four is less than X which happens to be less than positive four. And we get to combine this together as one inequality. So that's how you determine if you use the word or or not. If a number can be true for both, then you don't need the or, you put it together as one inequality, smallest to largest. Your symbols should always open left in that case. Uh, excuse me, open to the right, open to the right like that. Now, if, I know, if there's no number that satisfies both, like the previous problem, that's when you need the or. With all of that, uh, hopefully that was really helpful for understanding domain.
because uh, domain is something you're going to see all throughout the school year. So I thought it was really impact, uh, really helpful to try to go over quite a few more domains before we uh, just assume that you can do it on your own. Okay, now let's finally start with this new lesson, one, two. So today, today we're talking about analyzing functions and relations. So we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about functions and relations and how we can analyze them. So uh, first, it says here this function, f of x, approximates the profit of a toy company, where x is marketing cost and f of x represents profit. So profit is over here on the y-axis, and marketing is on the x-axis. It says both costs and profits are measured in tens of thousands of dollars. Use the graph to estimate the profit when marketing costs are 30 grand. Confirm your, your estimate algebraically. Okay, so we want to know if marketing costs are 30 grand. So which, x, which axis am I looking at, the x or the y? x. And this is in 10,000. So 30,000 divided by 10,000 would be 3. So you're looking at the x value of 3. So what I'm going to do is take a little uh, line here. I'm looking for the x value of 3, which is right here. And I'm going to go up and say, OK, there is my marketing cost at 30,000. What would you estimate the profits to be at 30,000? Just a little over 100 ten thousands. So if this is counting by 25s, maybe I want to say 105. Are you all OK with that? Because I'm a little above. I'm going to say 105 since it's counting by 25s. I'll say roughly, so that's approximately, uh, approximately usually takes two. So I'll do 105. This is talking money, so I better do a dollar sign. And this is in 10,000s, so I need to add four zeros. 105 ten thousands. One, two, three, four. 105 ten thousands. So if I put that comma in the right place, I'm estimating about... 1.05 million dollars. Wow, that's our estimate. Now, how could I confirm this algebraically? That's right, we learned this last class. You do function substitution. You'd plug in f of 30, since it was an x value, f of 30, and see what comes out. And I'll just use the calculator. And we want to know if this comes out to be 105. So let me clear this out. F, I don't have to type in the F of 30. Let's see, negative 5, parentheses, 30, close that parentheses, square that, plus 50 times 30. All right, what did we do wrong here? Oh, I know what I did wrong. Am I looking at 30 on the x-axis? No, what x axis value am I looking at? Three. three. Okay, let's correct this here. We need to find f of three, not. It's like that is not the number I was expecting. Let's try f of three. So I'll come back here and delete the. Oh, 105. Our guess was perfectly on the money. That is 105. And again, that's in 10,000, so it would be 105 times 10,000 which is a $1.05 million. So we got it correct. Okay, now we could guess this not only using the x-axis, but on part B, it says use the graph to estimate the marketing cost when the profit is $1.25 million. So again, what does that mean for the actual graph? If it's counting in 10 thousands, what that number would be is if you divided this by 10 thousands, basically four zeros get canceled out, which means you're looking on the graph for... Uh, if you cancel out the four zeros, one, two, three, four, we're looking for 125 on the graph. So I go to my graph and I need to notice that it's counting by 25s. So this would be 125 right here. And so let's determine our estimate. I agree, it looks like it's going to be five. So, okay, so is the answer actually going to be five? No, since we're counting in 10,000s, it won't be five, it'll be 50,000. So here, we're estimating that the marketing costs, the marketing we're estimating would be 50,000. How am I getting 50,000? Five times 10,000. 
which is 50,000. That's our estimate. And if we wanted to confirm, yeah, I could just plug in a five. And so let's just plug in a five up here and see if we get, yeah, 125, just like we were supposed to. So that is correct. That is the correct number. Questions over how to use a graph for estimating now? X is Y. So the key is just to look at what uh, what your units are, what they're giving you as far as like this one that says profit. So we went to the profits first. All right, with that, I want to give you one to estimate this problem. So I'll give you a few minutes. Actually, probably just about a minute. And then we'll come back on and see what you get. All right, let's take a look at example two now. It says, Jason bungee jumps from a bridge 100 feet high. He jumps two feet off of the ground. The equation of his descent is modeled by this function here. What is the relevant domain and range? Now, first, I want to address the domain, the domain of just this function right here. If you take out the word problem, the domain would be all reals. Do you know how I know it's all reals? What is my variable? Well, T, I, I got a big time error right here. That should be a T. I need to correct that. That should be a T. So F of T, here's my problem. The domain should be, as far as the equation goes, all reals. Why do I know that? Because the T itself, is it a T ever dividing? And is the T inside a square root? Uh, no, the number two is, but T, can two ever be negative? No, two is two. Two is not negative. So I don't have to worry about that square root. For this reason, this would be all reals. However, for a relevant domain and range, that is not true. So let me show you why this is the case. Relevant means according to the problem. Is it realistic to say the domain is all reals? And the answer here is no. 8 square root of 2t uh, plus 100. Okay. Here's our graph. Let me actually do a little, I'm going to change this a little bit. It goes as high as about 120, and I'm going to go down to negative 10. And I will look up to five seconds. So I want you to look at this. For a bungee jumper, question, this is, again, real world. If you were going to go bungee jump, would you launch off the ground, jump way up 100 and however many feet high, uh, 102 feet high, would you jump 102 feet off the ground and then come down? No. 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 Where would you start from if you were bungee jumping? Okay, now normally we would say the very top, but the problem did say he jumps from a ridge 100 feet high and he jumps two feet off the ground. So did he actually start at this spot? No. No, he started here. This is his jump upward, and then what takes over to make him start falling? Gravity. gravity. So here is his strength outdoing gravity. If you're wondering, the, the force of gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, you know, that force, if you've heard about that science, is working against him. But right now, his strength jumping is stronger. But the problem is, when you jump, your strength is only in that instantaneous moment. And then gravity starts taking, which is constant. It's just constantly pulling. And so he does go up. Two feet, Jason, this is. He goes up two feet, and then he starts to fall. Okay, so when we talk relevant domain, we're talking about re real for this situation. So for this situation, this whole graph is not realistic. Come on, why won't it let me take a picture? There it is. This whole graph is not realistic for uh, domain and range, the whole picture itself. So let me pull it over here, and we're going to talk about what is realistic. The realistic portion is starting time to the finishing time. So let's, sorry, got to get it minimized here. Where would this graph start from? Did we decide? Where did they actually jump from? What point in time did he jump? A height of 100 right here. So this part of the graph is bogus. This is not part of what we call the relevant domain. So you see how this word relevant is here? Relevant means they're like the real portion. That's part. Okay, he bungee jumps and he falls 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 and he falls. And he falls. Is that true? No. no. At what point in time are we in serious trouble? Zero. zero. If he hits zero, he's dead. he's dead, right? So let's talk about what should we do at zero? 
Do we ever want to hit zero? No. Let's do open circle. How about that? And so this part is now bogus. So I did a close dot at 100, all right, 0, 100. Let me do that. X value 0, 100. I did a open dot at 2.878. I'm going to write that in there. 2.878, 0. Okay, so now let's find the relevant domain. The relevant, that means, again, given the situation, what's realistic? The relevant domain. So we're talking X's. How far left does the X go? Zero. Zero. And I, bracket or parenthesis? Right. That's right. So if I was doing inequalities, I would do zeros less than or equal to X. If I was doing uh, intervals, I would do zero comma. How far right do I go? 2.878. And open circle, what does that mean? Parentheses or just a less than. Did that make sense for what relevant domain means? If not, please ask. This is the time to ask. So that would be my relevant domain. What would be my relevant range? So now we're talking how low to how high. Okay, I would say 0 to 100, but that wouldn't be perfectly accurate either. We go up to 102. So this point right here, that point right there was 0 0.354. 102. Okay, whoops. I didn't mean to do a bracket there. That's a coordinate point. Points are always in parentheses. 102. Parentheses. There we go. So the relevant range, how low do we say? Uh, above zero. Okay, above zero, which means zero is at less than or less than or equal to? Less than. Less than. I agree. So zero less than y or parentheses zero, and then how high? Uh, 102. 102, do we actually hit that point? Yes. Less than or equal to 102, uh, 102 bracket. That would be relevant range and relevant uh, domain. Now I will italicize those when I'm asking you those. I will not make it a trick. I will tell you very clearly, I want relevant or it was just in general domain and range. Does that make sense? I'll make it clear to you. I just want to make sure you knew what that was. Okay, this time I have no situation given other than find the domain and range. Do I have the word relevant on part B? No. So do, should I cut it off at the Y axis? Like the previous problem? Should I cut off all of this? Oh, by the way, I'm going to say this. For real world stuff, almost all domain and range is going to be uh, first quadrant. There's very few real world situations where we go outside of the first quadrant. One of them could be if you are a business, you could owe money to the bank. That would mean you have negative money. So that one you could go to the fourth quadrant if profits is your y-axis. But most real world will only be first quadrant. Everything outside the first quadrant 90% of the time is going to get removed in real world situations. This is not a real world situation. So I'm going to look at the whole graph. So let's talk domain and range here. And I'm going to use that trash compactor technique again. Remember I walked through this on the bell ringer? If I were to smash domain to the x-axis, so domain always goes to the x. If I were to smash these pieces, I'm going to call this piecewise graph three pieces. So piecewise was a name we learned last class. And I will color these so we can do this easier together. This will be my blue piece. I'll make this one be the red piece. And I'm going to have to highlight this one. I'll make this one be purple. Okay. So that's going to be there. I'm going to erase that in a moment. So don't worry about that. Okay, I smashed to the x-axis. What's going to happen to this blue arrow here? It's going to go down. Are you all with me so far? Okay, there's that domain there. The purple, what happens to the purple? Gets smashed and becomes flat. So it flattens out between here and uh, there. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, and it should have closed dots. I should have said that before, closed dots. Now the red gets shot up. 
and it comes with an open circle. Are you with me so far? Okay, as you look at this line, it looks like it goes forever to the left, comes through, I have a closed dot, so there's no break technically in the domain, and I come to this spot where uh, there's a purple one that's filled in and a red one that's open. Which one takes over, the filled in or the open? The filled in. Ultimately, this has color to it. So this is all reals. This domain is all reals. If you're using inequalities, you do XER. If you're using intervals, you would say negative infinity, comma, positive infinity. That's the domain. So even though this had three separate pieces, the domain was all reals. Even though it had an open circle, it was all reals. Okay, one more time. Why was it all reals when this has an open circle? Because the other one filled it. Very well said. That is perfectly accurate. The other one filled it. Okay, so now we do range. When you do range, you smash everything to the y-axis. So in vision, all of this gets smashed in. And remember, I'll make the middle piece be purple. Okay, I'm going to start lowest to highest for range here. So this red piece, it gets smashed. It's got an open circle, then solid. Okay, so as I smash this over, it starts with this open. But then all this portion of the line gets smashed in too. What happens to the open? It gets filled in. If you're going, wait, why does it get filled in? All of this portion of it fills it in. All of that filled that pot spot in. So we have that dot right there. Now I'm going to go to this. This is our purple piece. So when it gets smashed in, we'll have purple from here. This gets smashed in as a closed dot. It goes all the way up, and then it comes back down, and it's solid. It's a solid dot here, and a solid dot there. And now what happens with the blue? Let's see, it's pushed over and up forever. Okay, as we look at the range, will this range be all reals? No. Now, what's the lowest it travels? Negative six. What's weird is this is probably the first time, this might be the first time you've ever seen this. If it's just one number, you don't do a comma. So I'm going to do the interval. You would do brackets because it's closed dot. Negative six, close the bracket. There's a gap, which means union. I have a closed dot there. What does that mean? Bracket or parenthesis? Bracket. bracket. How low is that? Negative, Negative five. And this piece travels up. There's no break, and it goes on up forever to positive infinity. Bracket or parentheses? Parentheses. So the range, even though it's three pieces, the range became two intervals. So this is really interesting. A piece of graph that had three pieces, the domain was one interval. The range is two intervals, so isn't that strange? A piece, a graph with three pieces could become two intervals for the range, one interval the domain. Now, how would you write this? If you were writing inequalities, you do it like this. This would be x equals negative 6 or negative 5 is less than or equal to x. You don't have to write the infinities with inequalities. That's how you would write that. Remember, union means or. The question about the union, that happens when there's a gap. Anytime you have a gap, and it could be an infinitely small gap. What do I mean? If this was the only graph, was a solid line, open circle, solid line, it would still need a union right there. Even So that would be like an infinitely small gap. But if it's a gap, it needs a union. The domain, remember, did not need a union because this piece filled in this piece. When we smashed it all the x-axis, it got filled in. So there was no gap. Okay? Other questions on... I'll be here. Okay, I'm going to give you a chance to work on this problem, your domain and range. All right, let's take a look now at example three. It says, use the graph of this function to approximate the y-intercept. Then find that y-intercept algebraically. So the y-intercept is where it crosses the y-axis. To me, I see it's crossing the y-axis right here. If we count it up, the y-axis, I'd have one, two, three, four. 
So we would say our y-intercept is at 4. You could also do the coordinate point, 0, 4. That's the y-intercept. Now, if you wanted to confirm that algebraically, the way you would do so is you would find f of 0. f of 0 will always find you your y-intercept because the y-intercept is when x is 0. So if you did f of 0, you should get your y-intercept. You'll notice the math. What's 0 squared? Zero minus what's four times zero? zero? Plus four. So we have zero minus zero plus four, which equals four. So f of zero is four. That's correct. Okay. So again, we're talking about analyzing functions. So there's that function. Okay, here's an absolute function. Absolute value function looks like a V on the graph, and that's the symbols for it right there. It says use the graph of this function g of x to approximate the y intercept. Didn't find the y-intercept algebraically. Again, we look on the graph. The y-intercept appears to me to be at negative 1. So the y-intercept, you could just say, is if you label y-intercept, you could just say negative 1. But I'll go ahead and put it as a coordinate point just to remind you how that would look. It's always x comma y. So 0 comma negative 1. 0 comma negative 1. Let me make that a little cleaner. If you want to do the math, again, you just find... You plug in zero. So g of zero would equal the absolute value of zero plus two minus three. What is zero plus two? Two. two. So the absolute value of two, that just means that the number inside needs to become positive, regardless if it starts positive or if it starts negative. We make it positive, which two is already positive, so it just remains. So it's just two minus three. What is two minus three? So g of zero is, in fact, negative one. So that's confirming it algebraically. All right, your turn. I want you to approximate the y-intercept of this graph. Then you can find it algebraically. I'm only going to give you a few seconds. All right, example four. Now let's talk about zero. So if y-intercepts are where it crosses the y-axis, x-intercepts, the name that's frequently used are zeros. That's the name that's frequently used. We'd say zeros. That just means x-intercept. So on this graph, I see three separate zeros. I see a zero at negative one. I see a zero at zero. And I also see a zero at one. So the x-intercepts or the zeros would be at uh, negative one. This time, since there's three, I'm just going to say negative one. No, I'll stay consistent. We'll have negative 1, comma, 0, uh, 0, 0, and 1, comma, 0. From here on out, I won't write those out because that just gets long. So those would be our zeros. Now, how would you find it mathematically? Well, the way you find a 0 mathematically or algebraically is you set f of x equals to 0. The y value needs to be 0. So how I would solve this is I would say 0 equals x cubed minus x. So I just said f of x equal to 0. So not x equal to 0. f of x equal to 0. And you would solve from here. We would do a little factoring. So the first type of factoring you should check for is GCF. Is there anything shared between these two terms? Yeah. Uh, something greater than 0. Something greater than 1 is shared. X. Very good, Sydney. They both share an x. So I would have x, if I factor out x, I'm left with x squared minus, what's x divided by x? 1. For the sake of time, I'm just going to tell you, this is a difference of squares. We talked about this on day one, that if you're missing your b term, if you have your a term, the x squared term, and your c term, that's just the number by itself, but no b term, you can use that square root technique to simplify this, to factor it. You could also do x method where you say what's factors of 1 times negative 1, which is negative 1, that add up to 0. And you'll find out your two numbers are negative 1 and 1. You could do it this way. But I'm just going to do difference of squares here. I can say that factors to become x times. And so the way square root technique works is you take the square root of the a term, which is x and x. You take the square root of the c term. What's the square root of 1? 
One. one. You make one positive and one negative. Now using the zero product property from Algebra 2, if you're multiplying and you're getting a product of zero, there's only one way in all of mathematics to multiply and get a product of zero. Do you all know what that is? The only way to ever multiply and end up with the answer of zero is somewhere you have to have a zero. So what we do is we solve each one individually. We would say that, okay, x equals zero. Here, x would have to equal negative one because negative one plus one would have to equal zero. And then here, x would have to equal one. Notice those are our three zeros that we had earlier. There they are. So writing them from left to right, negative one, zero, one. That would be our solutions. Okay, so I took a little bit longer on that one to show you the factoring. That's how you find zero. So how do you find y-intercepts? What do I do on the previous example three? You substitute zero in. How you find zeros algebraically is you set the equation equal to zero, and you factor and solve from there. All right, your turn. Again, I'm no idiot. I'm very aware that you'll probably just look at the graph, and for that reason, I won't give you as much time. Now let's talk about symmetry. So in the analyzing, we've had x-intercepts, y-intercepts, finding points. Now let's talk about symmetry. There are uh, three types of symmetry that we'll talk about frequently, and that is you could have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, symmetry with respect to the x-axis. We could have symmetry with respect to the y-axis, which, by the way, we would call this, you're going to get this in the end of the lesson. You can write this in on this box, an even function. This is called an even function. And then you can have symmetry with respect to the origin, which this we would call an odd function. With respect, that means that's what it's rotating or flipping on. And it's like it's kind of like that's the mirror. So on this one, the mirror would be the x-axis. It mirrors what's on one side with the other. This one would be the mirror here. This one would be the origin, which that's a little trickier to think of. It basically means the first quadrant goes to the third, second quadrant goes to the fourth. That's the origin. Okay. If uh, even means first and second go three and four. Excuse me, not even. Even means first and four go two and three. Okay, here's a different question for you. If we call this an even function. And we call this fun uh, odd function. What type of function do you think this is? Who caught that? That was a trick question. Who said that? Very good. It is not a function. Why is this not a function? Because, because it, doesn't it doesn't pass, pass the vertical line. Test. It doesn't pass the vertical line test. Very good. That's not a function. Very good. All right, so let's talk about symmetry. So now that you've seen it, oh, and here's some rules, which we'll get to the rules in a second when I teach what how to find even and odd, but it, it's kind of going off the X and Y values. Uh, that's kind of helpful, but I'll get there in a second. So here's what it says. Even function is when the left side of the graph is reflected to the right, meaning notice, look at the two points here. I want you to see the rules here. When I reflect from this point to this point, which variable changes? The X, which one does not change? the y. So what this is showing you over here in function notation, the f represents the y. So the x changes from negative to positive, but the y, the f itself, stays positive. That's an even function. For odd, notice what changes? Both. Both. And so over here, we have a positive f, which means a positive y, and a negative x. If they're both going to change, what's going to happen to my f? It's going to be negative. What's going to happen to the x? Positive. So that's what they just showed you here. Even means only the x changes. Odd means both x and y changes. The uh, respect with the x-axis is when only the y changes. But you couldn't use function notation because, once again, it's not a function. So it's not there. Okay, so here we go. Example 5a here. It says use the graph and of the equation y equals x squared plus 2 to test for symmetry with respect to the x-axis, y-axis, and the origin and then support the answer numerically, then confirm algebraically. All right. I'm not going to get into all of that, but let's just talk about symmetry. What kind of symmetry does this have? What would reflect? It's an even function because what is 
it's symmetric with? With the x-axis, y-axis, or origin? Y'all doing all right over here? OK, so I need to hear more voices. I haven't heard much. What is it respect with? The y. The y-axis. Since the y-axis cuts in half, we would say respect with the y-axis. Symmetry. If you're going to write it out fully, you would say with respect to the y-axis. There it is written out fully. And it is also an even function. And the way to prove it is if you take any point over here, it should have a corresponding point where only the x value changes, the y stays the same. So for example, this one would be left two and up one, two, three, four, five, six. You see how that point is left two, up six? This point over here is right two, up six. Which value changed? The x, and it went from negative to positive, that's it. What stayed the same? The y. It's an even function because any point you choose, if you choose any particular x value, doesn't matter which one you choose, you will have an equal point where the y stays the same, meaning the f stays the same. It doesn't change. If y represents, or the f represents the y, it does not change, but the x simply becomes negative. This is always true in an even function. Okay, so that was the rule. All right, part B, looking at this graph. What does this have respect to? The x-axis, the y-axis, or the origin? The origin. the origin. Symmetry with respect to the origin. Okay? Symmetry. I'm going to say W period, R period. What, to with respect to the origin. What is that W dot R with respect to the origin? Okay. So if it has symmetry with respect to the origin, what that would mean is if you picked any point. Oh, sorry, there's another name. What's the other name we could call this? Odd function, good. It's an odd function. What that means is if you chose any point, any point on there, doesn't matter, any point at all. Let's just say we chose uh, this point right here, which I don't know what it is other than I'm gonna say it's a negative X and a positive Y. Would you agree with that? It's a negative x and a positive y. A negative x and a positive y. Its corresponding point will have a negative y but a positive x. So it would be however far over, same spot right there. These two points would be corresponding, whereas this is a negative 2. I don't know. I'm just going to say it's a 3. That might not be accurate. Then over here, it would be a positive 2 and a negative 3. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. What's happening? That's an odd function. All right. So here's this. Uh, they don't show us a graph, so I'm going to graph this right here. F of x. x squared minus 4x plus 4. Here's our picture. This, ladies and gentlemen, is what we call nothing. Uh, it, do, it is symmetrical, but not with any of these. So I would say it's neither. The symmetry is at, here's why I would say it's neither. The symmetry is, uh, I would say it this way, symmetry with respect to x equals 2. So it's neither. It's not even or odd. It just has symmetry with respect to x equals 2 because what cuts in half is the line x equals 2 right there. This is the line x equals 2. So you can see that cuts in half. Now, here's another way you can tell if something's even or odd is when you look at the equation, if it's even or odd, all the powers will either be even or odd. So you see how this one has a power of 1 right there? I have an even power and I have an odd power. Since I have both, it's neither. If it were going to be even, they would all be evens. If it was going to be odd, they would all be odds. Uh, and if you don't have an x at all, you treat it as x to the power of 0. So I have an even and an even and an odd. So that's neither. All right. 
So there's your shortcut for that. So looking at this one, I have x squared and I have a minus four, which is kind of like minus four x to the zero power. Two, is that even or odd? What about zero? It's easy, also even. Guess what this one's going to be? Even function. If it's an even function, what does it have res uh, symmetry with respect to? That's right. Symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Now let's see that. Let's see it. Uh, x squared minus 4. There it is. Uh, just to show you what the power would be if you're going to use the power shortcut. So if it doesn't have any x at all, it's x to the power of 0. Anything to the power of 0 is 1. So, all right, real quickly, look at this one. What can you tell me about the powers that you see going across here? Odd, even, odd, even. So what's that going to be? Neither. So it's ne uh, not even, not odd, it's neither. And if we looked at the symmetry, x cubed minus 3x squared minus x plus 3. If I looked at the symmetry, it has no symmetry. Goodness. Okay, so this is neither, and it has no symmetry. As we saw from over here. So none of those were odd? Uh, we did see an odd one. Odd was here. This is an odd function. Odd rotates over the origin, or reflects over the origin. I'm saying like, when you write it as like a... Uh, with the equation, yeah, it would have to be all the odd powers, so that's that's why. All right, your turn. Example five, DOL. All right, example six. So now I'm going to give you some functions, uh, just or function notation. That's what you call this function notation, and we want to determine if it's even, odd, or neither. If you haven't memorized this, it's okay. Let me just show you how to treat this. It's very simple if you just draw some points representing. Remember, f represents y. The x is the inside. This is saying have a negative x. So I could put an f there, but I'll leave it as a y because that's what we're used to seeing. A negative x and a positive y. I'm just going to put a little star to represent this point right here. Left and up. Negative x, positive f. You follow what I'm doing here? Okay, on this side, I'm going to do a green star. This has a negative y, but a positive x. Positive x and a negative y. I'll put the star there. What can you tell me? Is this even, odd, or neither? Uh, odd reflects over the origin. O's go together. This would be an odd function. How about that? Odd goes over the origin. O's go together. Evens across the y. And remember, if it's across the x, it's not a function at all. All right, part B. This time, this says we have a positive, uh, I'm going to switch colors, sorry. A positive y and a positive x. Positive y, positive x. What quadrant should I plot that star? First quadrant. First quadrant. Okay, here, this says the x is positive and the absolute value is on the y. That means no matter what, the y is positive. So x is positive, and no matter what, the y is positive. First quadrant. This would be neither. There's no symmetry if it's right on top of each other like that. This would be neither. So remember, even means across the y. Odd means across the origin. Doesn't matter which diagonal, it's across the origin. And it's not a function if it reflects over the x, but this is just right on top of each other. It's just neither in general. All right, what about this one? 
Very good. Someone said odd, and they might be guessing, but they are totally right. You know how we prove this? So it does go through the origin, which is necessary, but here's how you'd prove it. You would take a point. So how high is that point? Three, and it looks like it's just short of somewhere in between one and two. I already know what it is. I'm just going to tell you it's 1.71, basically. So let's just say it's 1.7. I'll just make it easy. Let's say that's 1.7 and up three. What you would need to check if it's odd, what happens with the values? Do they, there's only one change or they both change? Both. Both, both change. So I would need to go to negative 1.7 and see if that matches up with negative three. Does it? Yes. And so this would be an odd function. Your problem, DOL number six. All right, let's take a look at how this might be tested on the ACP. Now here, what I have done, I know this graph does not look like something pulled from a released ACP exam, and that's because it's not. I wanted to try to add some difficulty, but I did take pictures and then that you might see and add some difficulty. So here, if we were supposed to be tested for domain and range, you will get a picture and answer choices like such. This is how it might be tested when you go into Christmas. This is the difficulty you might see. So let's do domain. If we're gonna do domain here, what's the technique I used earlier this uh, today? Trash compactor. So let's smash this to the x-axis and see what we get. When I smash this first piece to the x-axis, that gets smashed, this gets smashed. And I'm going to do these, uh, I'll do this first one in blue. This arrow gets smashed up right here, this closed dot right there, and all this curved line will just be smashed flat like this. You okay so far? Yeah. Questions on piece one? I'll call it piece one like that. We'll do piece two in red. When I smash this up, I have an open circle right there, an open circle right here, and it's filled in the whole way. Are you okay with that for piece two? Finally, piece three. I'll do piece three in green. This closed dot gets smashed right there. This arrow gets smashed right there. And it's a solid line in between, all smashed. For the range, how far left will this graph travel? Negative infinity, can't eliminate anything. Do I break here at, this looks like it should be negative two. Do I break at negative two? One's closed, one's open. So the close takes over and fills in, it's not a break. So we keep going until, if that's four, that would make this, Six. So at six is our first break. Bracket or parentheses at six? Parentheses. Oh my goodness. Too easy. Answer should be eight. Let's just check real quick to make sure. Eight. Should it be a bracket or parentheses? Bracket. Goes on forever to the right. Okay. Don't range. If you smashed everything to the y axis. This is saying that there's a piece that goes down forever. Do you see a piece on this graph that goes down forever? This piece, is that piece gonna go down forever? Yep. And it says it'll only go as high as six and it'll be an open circle. The highest point on the graph was it here? Six, yep, that was it. And so that would be correct, eight. Hey. 